Welcome to the MSU Deer Labs online seminar series brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. My name is Steve Damaris and I'm the Taylor Chair in Applied Big Game Research and Instruction at Mississippi State University. Thanks for joining me. So this 45 day period is pretty consistent but exactly when it occurs varies and the when a deer population is going to breed tends to be optimized to match with long-term patterns of environmental variation and a long-term pattern of environmental variation is a long way of saying climate and let me just clarify when we talk about climate it's a long-term pattern what's happening today or tomorrow or last week that's weather and it's cold this week, it's warm the next week, it rains, it's dry. Those, that's weather variation. And these long-term patterns of climate help us understand when deer populations breed. Now, I've, you see three different boxes here, a green box, an orange box, and a blue box. And within each of those boxes are two numbers. The first number is the average low temperature in Fahrenheit during January and February. The second number is the total inches of snow received during a given winter. So down in central Mississippi we have 37 degrees as the average low temperature during January and February and on average we have no snowfall. If you move up a couple of states up into say central Kentucky you see the average January February low temperature is 24 degrees and they get about two and a half feet or 28 inches of snowfall and then moving up further north up into Michigan say you have an average low temperature in January and February of 11 degrees and a whopping 92 inches of snowfall which is about seven and a half feet of snow that's a lot of snow and this pattern of snowfall and colder temperatures going from the south to the north is probably not news to you but I pointed out to emphasize that these patterns of climate are really important to understand when deer populations produce fawns because if you breed at the wrong time of the year and produce a fawn at the wrong time of the year and that fawn does not survive then you have eliminated your genetic material from the population so there's this strong environmental constraint on when populations can and should breed this graph is a, a summary of breeding dates as a function of month on the horizontal axis and latitude from 20 degrees up to 50 degrees latitude and you can see there's three populations that were included that were sampled around the 50 degree latitude and they ranged in variation from mid-April to mid-May. As you move more southern latitudes we see a wider range of variation in when populations breed. Around 35 degrees we have a range of fawning. The fawning is taking place during May, June time period. And as you go further south still, down around 26 or 27 degrees latitude, which is southern extent of the United States, you see a wide range of fawning dates as wide as February, March, April, May, June, July, and into August. Now this is a combination of white-tailed deer and mule deer breeding dates. But the point here is there's a lot of variation in when populations breed. Across populations, the further south you go, the more variation in timing. So why do northern population breeding dates only have a very limited amount of variation. What are they constrained by? I've already given you a hint and it has to do with that climatic variation. They are constrained by the winter, the extreme cold and snowfall present in winter populations. If you don't produce your fawns early in the growing season, they will not have an opportunity to grow big enough to survive the following winter. Now if you produce them too early, they're going to die from cold and exposure. So there's an optimum time 
for northern deer populations to put their fawns on the ground. Southern populations is a lot more variation. Why? Think about that winter time period. What's the climate like in the south? There's a lot of variation in southern deer population breeding dates because there's not that extreme constraint placed on the population with the extreme cold and the extreme snow depth. Southern populations, why can they breed in a, a wider range? It's because they can. They can get away with it. If they produce fawns in one population a month later than another population, there's probably not going to be a large-scale death of fawns in one population because of the winter, the subsequent winter time. This map shows breeding date variation and clearly shows that there's a tendency for breeding to be early in the northern latitudes, October and November, and then as you go south, come into November, December time periods, but then that, that brown uh, indicating to November and December stretches all the way down into the deep south. Then you can see in East Texas, you have a pocket of October and November breeding, and then in Louisiana, Mississippi, Southern Tennessee, Alabama, there's a pocket of breeding during December and January. You can see some January and February breeding taking place in Southern Mississippi, Southern Alabama, Northern Florida. You have some fawning dates taking place in August and September in Florida, and even some July and August breeding taking place in far south Florida and then down in Mexico you can literally have breeding year-round and this pattern of north to south variation is disrupted as you get further south because the populations can successfully produce offspring in a wider range of time periods and then if you look within Mississippi we can see even more breeding date variation at a finer scale and we have a lot of fine scale data because our state wildlife agency has done an excellent job sampling breeding dates and so we have this really large database and we've documented breeding dates that peak as early as the 9th of December in the northwestern portion of the state into late December early January in the central part of the state and then down in the far southeastern portion of the state as late as the 23rd of January through the 6th of February. So we basically have peak breeding dates that vary by two months across Mississippi within a population as I showed you from that earlier Ashbrook Island population there's that typical 45 day range within a population but across the state of Mississippi we have a huge amount of variation. Why do we have this kind of variation within Mississippi? In contrast to the state of Ohio where I showed you earlier, they have a 45 day variation across their entire state. Why is that? Because the extreme climate in Ohio restricts the survival of fawns that are produced. If their does don't produce the fawns at the right time, their fawns will not be recruited into the population. So there's been a lot of interest in southern states in particular is understanding when deer populations breed. We've looked at a lot of demographic characteristics and some studies have shown that harvest strategy can affect adult sex ratio and adult sex ratio can have a significant impact on population breeding dates. If you have an adult sex ratio that is skewed in favor of females, and I mean really skewed, for an example, one buck per six or seven or eight females during the breeding season. If you have an, a skewed adult sex ratio, you can actually have a delay in when peak breeding takes place. Because if you have one male and six or seven or eight females that are coming into estrus at different places across the landscape, one male cannot cover all of those females. And so you have females that have missed breeding opportunities. They've been in estrus but no male there to breed her. And so she has to recycle about 28 days later a female that isn't successful, maybe is bred, but her 
fetus does not implant so she recycles or if she was not bred she will recycle about 28 days later and so that will shift the breeding date and, and that's a case where 45 days will typically not encompass 90 percent of the breeding because you have does that are breeding in their second and sometimes even their third estrus so that's not going to be a 45 day period and we've learned that we can fix this kind of problem by balancing the sex ratio this graph shows one property woodlawn hunting club from 1991 in yellow and in 2002 in kind of an aquamarine green there's a distinct pattern that we can see 1991 breeding dates were much later in the year than they were in 2002 the deer biologists working with the property increased the harvest rate which decreased the deer population density they improved the nutrition available to the deer population and they improved the sex ratio significantly and so by this management impact shifted the breeding dates basically a month earlier and this was due to effective deer management so if we have a problem with breeding related to poor management we can fix it I have another example of this from a property that I worked with down around Kerrville a couple of great biologists managed this property at South Fork Ranch uh, Bob Cook and Gene Fox and they took the property over from a former landowner that had not managed at all and they sampled their adult doe population when they first took the property over and the adult females had on average less than one corpora lutea or CL. The corpus luteum is an indication of the potential fetuses and ultimately fawns that could be produced. They took over management and within a few years they greatly reduced the deer density, they greatly reduced density of livestock on the property they did some significant habitat improvements and in a relative short time period of a few years they more than doubled the reproductive success on the property and shifted the peak of breeding from December 31st to November 15th that's a 45 day shift in the breeding date that's a huge management impact not all management actions are successful at shifting breeding dates there have been some cases in the southern United States where a biologist documented late breeding and they wanted to fix the problem because they had seen examples where a late breeding can be shifted earlier with proper management and so they attempted to fix this but they weren't able to shift the breeding earlier and that was cause of some frustration. Research by Jacobson and Lukafar documented evidence of maternal heritability of breeding dates and so there's this genetic heritability associated with that climactic variation, that long-term pattern. So we were interested in looking at a study in Mississippi and Louisiana to determine if there was a genetic linkage with some of the localized deer population breeding dates and Jason Sumners was another one of our MSU Deer Lab students who's now a biologist within the Missouri Department of Natural Resources but his study looked at breeding dates between deer populations and we questioned was there a genetic linkage to that timing of breeding within these populations and we looked at two different types of genetic markers one is called mitochondrial DNA and mitochondrial DNA is inherited only from the mother and we know that female filipatry and female filipatry is they tend to disperse a little bit but not as much as a male and so female filipatry tends to limit movement of mitochondrial DNA between populations and then nuclear DNA is inherited from both parents and we know that because it's inherited from both parents male dispersal tends to promote the exchange of nuclear DNA between neighboring populations. So in Jason Sumner's study we looked at the breeding dates and the genetics characteristics of populations with similar breeding dates and here's an example of 
two populations that are nearby to each other, 23 miles apart, and they had very similar breeding dates, two of our WMAs here in Mississippi. And we had a number of these pairs of populations. And then we had six pairs of populations with different breeding dates that were very close to each other across Louisiana and Mississippi. And here's an example from Louisiana, the North Bossier Hunting Club, and then the Barksdale Air Force Base. Those breeding date averages were separated by about a month, about 30 day difference in breeding dates between North Bossier and Barksdale. And we wanted to look at the genetic characteristics between populations that had similar breeding dates and different breeding dates. And what we learned was the mitochondrial DNA, that which is carried only by females, suggested that there was a much greater distinction between populations in the mitochondrial DNA when there were different breeding dates in the populations. Nearby populations that had similar breeding dates did not differ much in their mitochondrial DNA characteristics. And so we concluded that the populations that had different breeding dates were genetically more distinct than populations that had similar breeding dates. When we looked at the nuclear DNA, we found that there was a no difference in the relative similarity of population pairs. So because the nuclear DNA was similar between populations with different breeding dates, we concluded that the female filipatry was limiting the movement of their mitochondrial DNA and this, this genetic control of breeding that we documented in females led to a highly subdivided series of populations within the southeast. And you can have a population 25 or 30 miles away that might differ in breeding dates by as much as a month. And that's because of the female filipatry, the female's genetic lineage that controls the timing of their breeding compared to the males dispersing their nuclear material but that the males aren't controlling the timing of the breeding it's the females so we hypothesized that this difference was a persistent effect related to the genetics used for restocking we believe that there's this genetic structure of deer populations in the south that is controlled by female filipatry and that the lineage of these female populations, the source populations, influence these localized breeding dates. Some of the deer populations in the south originated from native sources. Other populations originated from groups of deer brought in from other states. And so we have this variation in breeding dates in the southern United States that is linked back in some cases to a source population that is not natural to that area. And that's why we have these localized patches of breeding. So what we've learned from a management implication is that genetics do control breeding dates and depending upon the source of the breeding control, you may have a limit to that population responding to a traditional harvest strategy change implement a change in density and age structure and sex ratio and habitat quality and you are unable to shift to an earlier breeding date. It might not be the fault of the management action, it's because the females are genetically programmed to breed later in that population. But if populations don't have this genetic effect, they should respond to harvest-based management of the adult sex ratio, habitat quality, age structure in the, in the male population. The things that biologists might recommend you to do on your property should have an effect on breeding dates if you are not affected by this genetic limitation.